I love multifamily. I like, you know, we buy self storage units, we buy uh, and build student housing uh, projects as big as 130 million, projects as small as 7 million. When uh, you're looking at an AGC debt and the loan to value dropped from 75 pre COVID to 65 post or during COVID, returns, I mean, are not the change. Same. By definition, they cannot be the same. Two and a half, three percent. They're making five to eight percent, and the delta is just pure profit on money that they didn't even. It wasn't even theirs to begin That's with. That's right. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host, broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. And today I'm going to be speaking with Jane Chatsky. So Jane is a financial expert. She's the CEO of HerMoney.com and the host of a podcast called Her Money. She's a financial editor of NBC Today for has been for 25 years, and the financial ambassador for AARP. She's frequently, you can see her on CNN, MSNBC, and on the Opera Winfrey Show. The New York Times, so she also has a New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author title. She has a title, which is amazing. And her latest book is called Women with Money, The Judgment-Free Guide to Creating the Joyful, Less Stressful, purposeful and yes rich life you deserve and i'm very excited to have her today on the show jane welcome to the show oh thank you so much for for having me yeah absolutely um so you know you're a very interesting investor you're you have um you have a lot of experience investing um and you have been throughout the years and you know i want to kick off the conversation by asking you what kind of assets do you invest in? How is it, How does your portfolio look like today? I am a boring investor, um, and uh, and that is by uh, by design. I um, I have followed my own advice for for many many years. Um, save enough. Uh, and diversify in low cost investments that essentially cover the bases. I, I, um, I came to the world of finance through journalism. So I uh, started reporting on personal finance when I was right out of college, um, ended up working on Wall Street for a couple of years in equity research. Uh, I, I worked for three healthcare analysts at Dean Winter Reynolds um, in the in the uh, early '90s, and learned the fundamentals of how to analyze and pick stocks. And discovered that um, well, discovered two things: discovered that uh, a I wasn't particularly good at it. Um, picking individual stocks. I, I, um, it took a tremendous amount of time to do that fundamental research. And the idea of just diversifying into funds, um, buying the markets, keeping the costs low, um, was working across the board for so many investors, so many pieces of research were showing that passive um, was the way to go. That's what I followed my whole life. Um, today, I am 56 years old. So I have a portfolio that says, hey, I'd like to slow down in about 10 years. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to enter retirement knowing that I've got enough income coming in so that I, I don't have to worry um, so that my mortgages are paid off and uh, and that will continue to spill off enough cash to support me and, and my family for as long as I live. So, and, and I think this is really interesting because I've been hearing that from some of my investors, the older they get, the more conservatives they conservative they want to be so they don't you know they don't want to risk the money that they, they have saved throughout those years they don't want to like you said you know they don't want to find themselves towards retirement age without a lot of money because they just made 
you know, a risky move. And when you said earlier that you're kind of investing, you know, you're kind of a born investor, what does that mean? What do you invest in exactly? I invest in um, very large uh, funds, index funds, ETFs, um, some, some, uh, uh, you know, a mix of, of stock funds and bond funds. Um, but it's a, it's an asset allocation strategy much more than it is a, a, um, an active strategy. Got it. So basically you're focused on investing passively in large funds. So you know that your money is steadily, steadily growing. So when you're ready to retire, because you have a lot going on and you're probably very busy, but when you're ready to retire, you know that you have this nest egg that is protected and it, it can't really, there are not going to be a lot of movements or risk there. Well, and I think that word protected is, is really, really important. So um, when we talk about protected lifetime income, we're talking about income that will, um, will last as long as you do, right? Most people in this country rely on social security um, for their support in retirement. I'm fortunate enough that that won't be the lion's share of my support, but it makes the decision about when to take social security, which is a, an annuity, um, really, really important. And it makes it important to look at your portfolio as you transition into retirement and think about, what sources do I have of protected income that will stick with me forever? Um, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a couple of pensions. Um, most people these days do not. And, and if you don't, it's important to take a look at what do I have in terms of income? I know your, your audience is, is real estate investors and they've got passive income coming from the portfolio of homes that they have put together, but how long can you count on that? Um, will it last as long as you do? And if you don't have that, I, I like the strategy of taking a chunk of the money that you have um, amassed in your retirement accounts or in your taxable accounts and, and thinking about converting it into a, a form of lifetime income while allowing the rest of the portfolio to have some market risk to continue to provide growth. Interesting. And I want to touch on something that you mentioned um, earlier, and I think it's kind of a good segue to um, our next part of the conversation about the process of building wealth, because you mentioned that you're lucky enough to have several pension funds, but many Americans don't have, you know, even one. And if they, if they're lucky to have at least one uh, pension fund that can potentially take care of them when they're ready to retire, what steps did you take to actually build your wealth? Because, you know, we have some listeners that, you know, may have 50 or hundred K, they may have some money in their pension funds or 401k, they may not. And, some of them would be really interested in learning from you after, you know, you've done it and you've built your wealth. What would be the, the first steps to, to do that? It's all about saving enough in my book. Um, it's all about figuring out how you can live um, in a way that allows you to consistently year after year after year, put at least 15% of whatever it is you're earning away for the long term and then put that money to work. Um, but most people are not there with the 15%. And if you're not there with the 15% when you're fairly young in your 20s or in your 30s and you don't come around to it till your 40s or your 50s, 15% is not going to be enough. And you've got to increase that to 20% or 25%. Um, and, and that just requires some discipline, right? If you're, if you're earning a, a decent living. Um, if you're not living on the, the paycheck to paycheck edge where you have trouble paying for your needs, then looking at how much you're paying for your housing, how much you're paying for your transportation, how much you're spending on, on things that are not needs on a day-to-day -day basis so that you can funnel more money into savings for the long term is is a hundred percent key and it's not easy to do 
right? Human beings are not wired to be good savers. We are wired to um, to indulge our impulses for gratification for the things that we see and the things that we want. And particularly coming out of this pandemic, I think that those impulses are running really hot and we're gonna have to watch ourselves. Um, once the money is in, preferably a tax advantaged account like a 401k or an IRA, you gotta put it to work. Um, and that means an asset allocation strategy um, of taking more risk when you are younger and less risk when you get older and having the fortitude to stick with that strategy through the ups and downs of the markets. And I think that's gonna be very important in the coming months, years, because the sort of returns that we've been seeing in stocks over the last couple of years, they're just not sustainable, right? I mean, and and I think it's really important when you run a retirement calculator, when you look at um, how much money is this money that I'm saving and investing going to produce for me, you should not be putting the sort of returns that we've been receiving lately yeah. into that calculator. Be conservative, you know, 7%. 8%. Some people think that's too high and would say 6%, um, you know, just to make sure that you're doing the real work of saving enough. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think you touched on a very interesting point. And it, it th this is relevant for any type of asset class, you know, from uh, ETFs to real estate to alternative investments. It has been such wonderful even, you know, the last five years were great. And just assuming that the next five years or, or two years or, or 12 months are going to be the same, you know, I wish I'm wrong at what I'm saying, but it, we're probably not going to see that growth. So you're absolutely right. Just be conservative and assume kind of the bet, the, the worst scenario would be prudent. You can always be pleasantly surprised, but don't bank on those high returns because they may not be there. And when you have that in mind, when you have that mindset, then you can make informed decisions on how to invest, how much to, to save um, when you don't assume that the market is, is going to keep producing such high returns. Um, another question that I have around process is, you know, some listeners are listening to you right now and, and they say, okay, I'm in my late twenties, mid thirties. I want to start saving and put 15 or 20% of my income. And assume, assuming that they do have that amount, what would be the next step for them? Should they try and do it on their own, do their own research? Should they go to a platform, a certain pla online platform to invest on their own, or should they hire someone to help them invest and build that wealth? I don't think in your 20s necessarily, unless you have a lot of money, you need to hire someone. Um, I think there's a, there's a difference between having a financial advisor and getting a little financial advice when you need it. And people, I think, in their, in their 20s and, and early 30s probably just need a little financial advice for the most part. Um, the biggest process helper is automation. Don't rely on yourself to contribute that 15 to 20% every single time you get paid. Automate it. So if you're in a 401k, the reason that 401ks work, the reason that they're so successful is that they are automated, that they pull the money out of your paycheck before you have an opportunity to spend it. But many, many people do not have 401ks available to them um, and have to rig up their own retirement accounts, whether they are IRAs, Roth IRAs. If you are self-employed, you should be looking at a SEP IRA, which allows you to put away substantially more money than you can put into a traditional or Roth IRA. But then figure out what your income looks like on an average basis. And every single month or every single paycheck, zap that money out of your spending account and into your retirement account so that the savings happens. As far as where to put it, um, sure, a robo-advisor is fine. 
Um, there are there are many to choose from these days, not just at the standalone robos, but at the traditional firms which have built robo advisors into their platforms. Um, you want to keep your costs low. You want to make sure that you're maximizing tax efficiencies, and um, the most important thing is that you're that you're saving. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially during COVID, like you mentioned before, the urge to go and spend because we've been in the house a lot, we're not traveling as much. So we have a little bit more disposable income. And the urge is let me just, you know, buy this bag or pay for, you know, something that I normally wouldn't do it because I haven't been spending that much money. I've been home for the last, you know, 18 months or I haven't been traveling a lot, which is where also, you know, a lot of Americans are spending money. Um, so I think, I think that's a very, um, that's a very good advice and very important advice for those who are starting to, to save money and start investing in it, automated through 401k, that could be a great way to start investing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, about the strategy of um, incorporating happiness when it comes to investing. That's the, the, the more fun part of our conversation today. You have the 10 commitments of financial happiness. What is it all about? What are the 10 commitments? Oh, well, I, you know, let's, let's talk about a couple of them. Um, uh, and, and for your listeners to know, you know, we, we write about this all the time at hermoney.com. And I talk about it a lot on the Her Money podcast. So I hope that you'll go there and, and join us and, and uh, become part of our community as well. Um, to aspects of happiness that I want to touch on. The first is that it's not about how much money you have. It's about how much control you have over whatever money you have. And that control manifests itself in a number of the ways that we've already talked about. So people who save consistently are happier. People who have goals, that they have broken down into benchmarks that they can then meet on the way to those goals are happier. And, and this is all something that I know, these are all things that I know because I conducted a large piece of research of over 5,000 people and looked at what were the habits that moved people from uh, feeling stressed out about their money, which happens all the time, Yep. to feeling happier, to feeling more financially content. Um, the other big, uh, big piece of your happiness is using your money in a way that lines up with your values. Um, you do this in how you spend your money, how you give your money, but also how you invest your money. Um, there's a reason that ESG investing is growing like gangbusters. You know, first of all, we, we now know we don't have to compromise returns when we invest with our values, but also it's being led by women and millennials who feel really strongly that we wanna use our money to create the change that we wanna see in the world. And so when you, purchase something, when you invest, when you give, you know, it, it's important to think about, does this line up with how I want to live my life and how I want to support the organizations that I believe in? Absolutely. I think these are very, very two important rules to live by. Not Some of them are uh, maybe harder than others, but I, I definitely think that there's, there's a lot of value in investing alongside your values and finding the, those type of investments that are going to make you feel um, more whole and more, more fulfilled that you're doing something good with your money besides just letting it grow. Like you, like you've said, if you can invest and take care of your retirement and grow your money, but also do good, then it's a win-win. Sure. And basically that why not, if you don't have to compromise your returns. Well, that was an awesome conversation, Jane. Thank you so much. And we have arrived to our last part of the interview, which is the lightning round questions. Are you ready? Ready. 
All right. So Jane, what's your favorite hobby? That's our question number one. Uh, yeah, probably running, but maybe cooking. Mm. And, and the fact that I like both of them works to uh, just keep me healthy. <laughs> That's great. Um, and what's the one thing that people don't usually know about you? Uh, I am actually a little bit shy. Ah, okay. Um, what's, what do you wish that you had known when you first started investing? That it wasn't rocket science. Mm -hmm. All right. I love it. Um, what's your number one advice for our listeners who want to scale their portfolio and, um, increase their investments this year? Uh, save more and, um, have patience because I think it's going to be a rocky one. All right. And then lastly, Jane, where can people find you if, if our listeners want to buy your book or join your community? Where, how can they do that? So two ways. Um, please go to hermoneyoneword.com. Sign up for our newsletters. You can subscribe to our podcast um, or you can follow me on social and it's at jeanchatsky.com at J-E-A-N-C-H-A-T-Z-K-Y um, at, at, at Twitter, at Insta. I'm just Jean Chatsky. All right, Jean. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and you being here on the show. Thank you again. My pleasure. All right, guys, that's it for today. Be bold, be great, keep moving forward, and I'll see you on the next episode.